Okay, hello, hello. Is anybody out there? Testing one, two, three. La da 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 da. Da 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 da. Let's see, microphone check. Testing. Yes, that works. Everything looks good. All the buttons are pressed. Just no people. That's all. Other than that. I always feel that way when the start says there's some kind of delay. I always feel like nobody's here. But I know you're out there. Ah, see, there comes people. Hi, guys. <clears throat> Let's see what we can do. Let's get ready to trade. All right, so screen sharing on. Let me know when you can see me. Very exciting stuff. Lots of things happening. Look at that market coming back. Unbeatable. Neil Bloom says casinos were doing well before the pandemic. Well, that's not really helpful information, Mr. Bloom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Screen seems to be working. Everything's going good. And we've got to do this, and then we'll be ready to go. Okay, hello, Missy. Do, 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 do. And read it. Uh oh. Access to oh. this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. Consult a licensed broker or registered investment advisor before placing any trades. All securities and orders discussed are tracked and monitored in virtual trading accounts. Virtual account prices and returns may differ from actual trading results. Commission costs are excluded. Neither PhilStockWorld.com, PSW, nor its affiliates, nor any of their respective officers, personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors are in such capacities licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, or registered broker dealers. Nothing contained in this webinar, website, or promotional material constitutes a promotion recommendation, solicitation, or offer of any particular investment, security, or transaction. Trading options involves risk. Visit the OCC website, www.optionsclearing.com to read characteristics and risks of standardized options. PSW provides education and trading services that are meant to teach you the risks and potential rewards of trading options. And we are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not implying or guaranteeing any profit. As always, do not trade with money that you cannot afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results, and results discussed in this webinar are not typical and are only valid on that specific or identified date. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless from any losses you may incur as a result of information discussed in the media identified above. By accessing this webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously, and we will not distribute or sell your information to anyone. All right. Now, let's see what's going on in the market. Uh, da, 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 da. That can be smaller. And these all look good, and that gets out of my way, which you can't even see. All right. No windows. I do not want to talk to you now. All right. So what are we looking at, guys? We have a bouncy, bouncy market, but it's really just flat lining. There's nothing exciting about it. If we go to look at the volumes, and I just go to Yahoo, and I look at the SPY volume, because that gives you a good indication of what's being traded. And you go to the historical data. Oh, I'm sorry, on the first screen, you can see that the average daily volume doo -doo 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 -doo, is 80, uh, so 80 million a day is the average. And um, so any day you're doing 80 is a good day. But look where we are now. We're at 21 right now. We're at, what is it, 1 o'clock already? <clears throat> Yesterday, 74, 80, 28 on Friday, 45 on uh, Wednesday. So around Thanksgiving, like not even a whole day's volume in two days. Uh, all these are low. Look at that. I mean, so the average is 80. And of course, the average is being brought down by these constantly. So it's just dwindling, dwindling. We used to average, we used to average two, three hundred million a day. 
You know, and I'm talking a few years ago, and now it's like 80 million. Like trading is halted. It's really all being done by robots. Very few people actually trading the market these days. Um, it's all just ETF funds and things like that. Um, you know, and uh, so so this is what's coming in with the volume. It's just really pathetic. So that's why you can't go by anything happening now. It's so easy to manipulate this. The volume so far today is 21 million. That's that's just insane. That's we, we'd be amazed. We probably won't hit 60 for the day. So it's slowing down. It's only December 2nd into Christmas. We're going to go to crazy lows like this on a regular basis. Um, and that just means everything you see here is bullshit. Um, you know, it's like, uh, you know, if you, if you see a river moving in a certain direction and someone says, could you predict what's going to happen? You say, well, it's going to pretty much go that way because it's a freaking river. It's going to, it's got a flow that's big enough where you can judge that it's going to keep going in a certain direction. But if you see a trickle of water going down on the line and they say, what way is it going to go? If it, you know, obviously if it hits any obstacle, if anything happens, it can veer off completely. That's what this is. This is a trickle. You don't know what's going to happen. And it's too easy to influence. And that's all it takes is this. You see this? That's all it takes is one guy putting his finger in the way and he can reverse the direction. This is not a lot because the whole day's volume is not there. So it just takes a little, a little, see these things? That's, that's what it is. These are people stepping in and changing the direction of the market. And when the, and when the volume of the market is this low, it's very, very easy to manipulate the market. When the volume is heavy, you can't, this won't manipulate it. This won't make, make a difference, right? Um, you know, it's like it's like if you have a trickle of water and you shoot it with a, with a water gun, you can totally alter its course and mess it up completely. If you have a river and you shoot a water gun into a river, nothing happens. Same water gun. It's a question of the volume of the flow that's going in the direction and how easy it's going to be to change it. And so manipulators love low volume markets. Just like this oil, also very easy to manipulate. I just commented on that in the chat room, and I said this is this is silly. Um, didn't make a bet though, because again, it's too easy to you know you we don't know what's going on. Yeah, there's nothing here where you could say so you don't because I know OPEC's having a meeting, so you don't want to bet against it because you don't know what rumors coming out of OPEC. But um, I just said right here, right when it was peaking, because I was like, absolutely no reason for this move. Must be something OPEC said. So that was a bit before it pulled back. What time is this? 12.34. And uh, where was this? 12.20. So right right about the same time. So basically, yeah, here's 12.30. So anyway, that's, that's, that's I, I, it was obvious to me. I just noticed it going back up. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Because <laughs> that's what I do. I see, I see oil going back up. And I say, why is this happening? So I check the news, and there's nothing particularly newsy about it, but I do know. And that, by the way, is important, too. You, you can't just check the news. You have to know what's going on in the world. Um, you know, you go to USO here, and it says, oil mixed over supply concern, vaccine development, oil up over surprise draw. What's it? Okay, see, so there's an interesting one. Surprise draw. Oh, that was last week. No, that makes no sense. Um, there's no news on the USO, okay? And if you go to Google, uh, Google's actually no good for this. You gotta go to Twitter. Um, this is what Twitter is actually good for, though, if you want to find out if something's actually being discussed. So Twitter. Oh, no, login. I don't know my login. Is that right? Hey, hey. Nope. Damn. Nope. Nope. Okay, I have no idea how to get it. Ah, 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 wait. (laughs) 
Ha! Figured it out. All right. So, we get into Twitter. And we say, uh, we see if you say oil, it's a problem because it's too, too uh, easy of a category. But let's take a look at oil or hashtag oil. Let's say that. I mean, that will hopefully eliminate oil paintings. Uh, and you want to say latest, I guess. Ah, well, nothing really. See the oil paintings, you always get oil paintings. Oh, that's really good. Look at that. <laughs> wow. What you discover on Twitter. Dun, 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 dun. Anyway, so so nothing really particularly interesting here. Oil EIA maybe says something. All right. Gasoline demand last week uh, versus previous week. That's awful. Look at that. Thanksgiving. Let's give well, whoever he he oh, this isn't the actual report. It doesn't say Thanksgiving exclamation. He's pointing out though that eight million barrels were consumed last week, but eight million barrels were consumed every week. There was no increase in usage into Thanksgiving. That's a freaking disaster. That's not a good thing. Individuals drove left. Uh, notable as it locked down some regions. So the, uh, he's got okay. This guy's got a whole bunch to say on it. Very good interpretation. But here's the, here's the point. The EIA report, minus 07, that's Thanksgiving week. No drawdown. A building gasoline, a building distillate. This is a freaking disaster. So why would oil go up? So then I was looking to see if, if, if OPEC said anything, because it certainly isn't because of the uh, EIA report. And now I'm looking for OPEC. Did they, did they say something? Did they get their shit together? Are they going to do something? Uh, and there's really, uh, so, so, so anyway, point being, it's one thing to look at the news. It's nothing to actually know what's going on. I know they had the OPEC meeting. I know that they, uh, did not have a resolution as of yesterday on the OPEC meeting. Uh, therefore they're coming back. They didn't, they didn't end the meeting. They're going to come back tomorrow, I think, and have more meetings and more talks, but they've not so far actually agreed to do anything. Um, so it was possible that this start, this surge was caused by some sort of an agreement or a rumor of agreement coming out of uh, Vienna, but we, I don't, I don't know for sure. I wasn't able to check. I didn't see anything in particular about it. Therefore, don't bet, even though it was a very tempting short, because it seemed ridiculous. I'm like, why the hell would oil go up from 44.50 to $46? That's a dollar fifty move. On nothing, especially on that report. That that report was awful. But of course, they want to manipulate and keep the price up to the holidays. And why is that? Because we're using in this country um, 18, 16, 17, whatever barrels of oil, million barrels of oil per day. So if you can keep the price up, Instead of being uh, $40, you have it at $44. Give me a calculator. So 16, let's say 17 million barrels a day times $4 is 68 million barrels a day times 30 days, $2.4 billion. So that's how much money is riding on keeping oil instead of letting it go down to 40, keeping it up around 44. You're going to pick up an extra $2 billion. Somebody will make that money. That's a lot of money. So will they pay off some guys at the NYMEX to trade oil up? Will they, will they fake a couple of orders? Will they dodge a couple of barrels? Of course they will. Of course. That's their job. What do you think OPEC's doing? OPEC's whole, <laughs> the whole purpose of OPEC is to jack up the price of oil. They're not there to keep the price of oil down. They say they are, but that's bullshit. Everybody knows that's bullshit. When oil was $150 a barrel, you didn't see OPEC saying we must increase production and put a stop to this stuff. 
They're like, oh, oh dear, we are going to hurt the world economy with this hundred dollar barrel of oil pricing. We must, we must double our production immediately to bring the price of oil down. That never happened. But if oil goes down to forty, emergency meeting right away, cut production. So they're they're there for one reason. They're there to keep prices up, not to keep prices down. Now, that's led to their own demise because realistically, what happens is when you allow prices to hit $100 a barrel, as they did in 2008 or whatever the hell that was, um, 2007, I don't remember, some bad times. Um, it was Bush was president, I remember that. Um, so when you allow oil to go to um, $100 a barrel, you cause gasoline to be $5 a gallon. There's 40 gallons in a barrel. So $5 for gasoline is still $200 a barrel. It's still a lot of and still profit for the refiners, right? Um, so when you allow the oil to go up to those prices, though, you are pushing gas prices up to 4 or $5 a gallon. And that then begins to impact the consumer in such a way, and we all remember this, we we're all old enough for this, of course, you all remember paying 100 bucks to fill up your tank or 50, 75, whatever the number was, if you have small, I have, I, I, I have huge cars. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big car guy. Um, so anyway, so, you know, I mean, I, I, I would, when I'm whipping, you know, but that's the thing though, even me and I've got money, but even me, I'm like, when I'm whipping out a hundred dollar bill to pay for my freaking gasoline, I'm pissed off. And I, and I am thinking about it all the way. And, and yes, uh, that is why I, that, that is, that in fact is why uh, I let go of my Range Rover. I didn't get I didn't get a new Range Rover after on that turn because um, I was I was just like I said this is ridiculous paying this kind of money filling up every week with a hundred bucks. It's just crazy five thousand dollars a year to fill up your car. So <laughs> that thing got like I think I think that thing got like if I was lucky it would get fourteen fifteen miles a gallon average. Um, what a car. Oh, I loved it. <laughs> it was like a tank. Um, anyway, so, uh, you know, that, that's the point, though. It, it influences behavior. It does change your behavior. It does make people think twice about the kind of car they're buying, and they make long-term decisions that destroy demand. And that is true of any commodity. You, know, you learn this stuff in economics, but it doesn't stick because people don't come out of these economics things. And these, you know, these oil people, they go to they take they go to classes, they go to regular colleges, they understand this stuff, or they heard it at least. Um but uh, you know, I mean they don't pay attention. They don't really think about it in the right terms because when you destroy demand, it's a long term issue. And once you reset people's thinking, once you start down the path of getting people to want hybrid cars and getting people to not want gas guzzlers. You change the consumer perception of things and the world changes a bit. And that's what happened. We, we began setting mileage standards. We began downsizing our cars. People were getting smaller cars. Now we're, still, we're now we're back to getting bigger cars, but that's because the bigger cars now have 20, 30 miles a gallon anyway. It's not like it used to be where you had 11, 12 miles a gallon in these big SUVs and things like that. These are now getting, you know, good mileage. Well, not good mileage, but, but you know, reasonable mileage, at least, in these bigger cars. People still want big cars, but they want good mileage big cars. But this is where OPEC so sowed the seeds of their own destruction. They uh, allowed gas prices to get to the point where it altered consumer behavior, where people started prioritizing that, I've got to be careful about the kind of car I buy because I don't want to spend too much on gasoline. It got people to say, ooh, this alternate energy thing is a good idea because we can't rely on oil. It's getting crazy expensive. So they, they affected a change in the behavior of the people because of their greed. They should have controlled the price of oil. They should have made sure things did not get too expensive. And that's what's going on here in the market, too. The greed of the Wall Street guys, of the fund managers, 
uh, the people who are manipulating the markets currently and, and pushing them up at every turn and not letting them drop, that it's greed. They are cashing in now, they are bringing the market up, and then they are selling, look, they bring it up, and then selling on volume all the way into the close, and now they're bringing it up. They didn't bring it up. See, they brought it up here on this spike. It lasted for a long time. This spike gave them momentum all the way up to here. It lasted here. Then they kick in and sell. Notice the selling volume is more than the buying volume. All right. This, I mean, this, this doesn't count as buying volume. That's selling volume. Here's the buying volume. Here. This buying volume and this bullshit in the futures was enough to kick it up to this level. Then we open the next day. And they pushed it up to the top here, but then boom, selling, 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 and then back, and then all selling all the way down. Okay, and the buying only started here. This is where they started buying. This little spot here gave them spin, and then selling, selling, selling all this volume here, this mat, this volume compared to this volume. Why do they do this? Because <clears throat> the private investors, the big money private investors, they jack up the prices, then they sell into the closings, because in the closings, you have the uh, fund managers have to buy the ETFs and such. At the end of the day, you get, you know, you work, you put your money in your 401k, and your 401k has to buy at the market close. So they don't do it every day, but different ones do it on different days. But they buy at market close. So if the if the if more money pours into the 401k plan or the or the IRA or whatever it is, and that IRA has these ETFs, when the money increases, it's a blanket allocation. You guys have all filled these out at work for something, right? So it's these blanket allocations that your money, your salary, is being put into these uh, IRAs into the, I'm sorry, into these ETFs, uh, you've chosen them or your, or your IRA or, or 401k plan chooses them. And they then, they then invest in multiple ETFs. Those multiple ETFs have to turn around. And as the money pours into them, they buy stocks. They don't sell stocks. You don't, you don't invest in short funds. You, you're probably not allowed to invest in short funds in your 401k IRA things. Um, they are mostly long ETF funds. And so you are the one who's buying at the end of the day. You're the one that's buying on market close at whatever price is set. And since they know that they have to, um, they, they know you have to buy, they know that you have to buy. You're being forced to buy through your, through your ETFs. So these guys jack up the price and then they sell into the close because they know that these funds kick in and have to buy the crap that they're selling. So they can get some big volume selling right into the close when they want to. But if they start by jacking it up, think about it. They spend this much money. See this area here, this much. They spend that much money jacking it up. Then they sell off double what they bought. So you pump it up and you sell it off and then you let it go again. And then here's eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah, pump it up and to be continued and then sell it off again. And that's how they dump out. That's how the insiders dump the market even while it looks like it's still okay. And that's why we have that thing that we call the spitting cobra pattern. And that's when that's kind of alerts you to that happening on a chart. Uh, we'll probably see it if we look at some charts. Nope, not that chart. Those charts. Let's say daily. No, no, you're not really seeing it there. What's a good that, that's this is a good spinning cover like this. So you see how you get the you got the little support tail. This is a, the counterweight. You have the quick up move, then you have all this choppy shit that's consolidating, it's coiling, and then suddenly it's gonna go boom and down. You know why it does that? Because eventually these guys get their fill. These people who are manipulating the market eventually sell off, they close their books. And you know when they're gonna close the books? Before the end of the year, they're gonna close their books. They're gonna have dumped out all the longs that they have in their portfolio, and then they're gonna let the market go. And then all of a sudden, 
all these manipulations are going to stop, but the selling's still going to be there. People are still going to want to sell, but there's no fake buyers anymore, and the market starts dropping. And you can see it kind of starting to form. You're definitely forming here, definitely forming here. It's like a snake crawling up, ready to strike. And what happens when a cobra strikes? Well, they don't go strike up. They strike that way or down because of gravity and physics, right? They can't, you can't strike up because snakes can't fly. <laughs> That's why. And, and the market can't, can't strike up because markets don't fly. They look like they're flying, but they're not flying. On the whole, though, look at the uh, monthly view. So, <clears throat> so this is what we've been doing all this time, up and up. Look at the Nasdaq. Oh, shoot, geez, that's flying. And the Russell. And interestingly, the Russell, though, not doing so good, frankly, compared to the other indexes. The Nikkei <clears throat> has been having a really good time under Trump, right? Almost doubling. Euro stocks, not so much. Not very much a bit ahead of where they were. The German stocks starting in 2017, not really much ahead of where they are. 10%, 20%. No, not even 20. 10, but uh, maybe, maybe 20. All right, let's give them 20. Um, VIX used to be in the low teens on a regular basis. Now it's 22. Still very volatile. Let's see if I have any questions. Alan says, OPEC meeting tomorrow morning to decide if to delay production increases. Uh, I, I don't see how they have a choice. This Christmas is going to be a bust. Obvi it's obvious. I don't see how it's not obvious. Uh, we were talking about that this morning. We're going to talk about that next. Brendan says, would you short crude here? Uh, it's just, it's too uncertain. It's, it's, you don't know what this OPEC meeting is going to say. If if OPEC comes out and does some bullshit and it raises the price more, I'm going to be very enthusiastic about shorting it. But it's hard because as you come into the holidays, coming into Christmas, they are going to do whatever they can to jack up the price so they make that extra $2 billion. It's very important to them. You don't want to deny them their money until the holidays. So it's kind of hard to bet against when you have this sort of situation. It's tricky. And what do we talk about today? Let's say. Well, the beige book, yeah, oh, beige book in a half hour. It's, very, it's no longer exciting. They reformatted it and I hate it now, but we'll take a look. Oh, you know what? We should look at this guy. Here's the EIA. We'll see if they, I don't know why, but lately the EIA has never been updating on time. So we'll see if it comes up today. Hmm. Ending November 27th, does that sound right? Ending, wait. Friday? Why does it end Friday? Usually it's like Saturday or Sunday. Ugh, I hate this. All right. So the week ending November 27th, I don't know if you're comparing apples to apples. Okay, let me see. last year, indulge me for a second. Last year was November 29th. No, last year was Friday too. That's interesting. Nope, that's not going to work. Damn it. All right. So, we're getting November 27th. Uh, inventory, blah, 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 blah. Imports average 5.4, commercial crude inventories, okay, decrease by 7, right. All right, so what do we see here? We see that we are still exporting almost 3 million barrels a day, that we're exporting. On the whole, we're, oh, 19, I've said 17. 19 million barrels a day of product is supplied, 3 million of which we export. So out of 19 million barrels, 3 million are exported, and 3 into 19 is too difficult for me. Um, fifteen percent. We export fifteen percent of the oil that we built, that we produce in this country, the products that we produce in this country. 
So, and that's interesting though, because especially when you consider, look what we import. We import, this is the most important number. We import 4 million barrels a day. Oh, and by the way, that's also notice that's very down. We imported last year 3 million barrels a day. Now we're importing 2.4 million barrels a day. That's 500,000 barrels a day less than last year. 3.5 million barrels a week less oil is being imported into the U.S. That is a very significant number when you're reacting to a draw on the EIA of a couple of million barrels one way or the other. And we're importing every, we're importing every week 3.5 million less barrels. And we're exporting, no, well, we're exporting the same, but we're exporting 3 million barrels. But the bottom line is, look at this, 2.4, 2.9. We're exporting 500,000 barrels a day more than we produce. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, more than we import. So why are we why are we importing? It doesn't make any sense, right? We're in, and, and and the reason we're importing is because we have refineries and they have spare refinery capacity. See the refinery capacity, 77%. We have a lot of excess refinery capacity. So we import oil, refine it, and send it back out. But we are refining for other places. We are refining, taking our refineries are doing the job for other countries. That also makes refineries kind of a scary uh, investment because they're very subject to taxes, tariffs, and restrictions because they can really screw up their model because their model right now is 15% of what they're producing is not being produced for Americans. So if you think about our refinery capacity, we're at 77% capacity, but 15% of our total output is exports. So for what we actually need in the U.S., we're down we're down to like 60 percent for what we actually need in the U.S. If we weren't producing for other countries, our we'd be that we would be utilizing 60 percent of our capacity. That's crazy. That's that's what I mean by long term damage. We've completely changed the way we the way we deal with oil in this country, and it's not coming back. Yet somehow, for some reason. We're only paying 20% less for gasoline than we did last year, even though we're not really using it, even though we're using 10% less, even though we have 77% refinery capacity. It's a weird business that can, that can still demand a premium price like that. So, and, 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 and stimulus isn't gonna change this. You know, stimulus isn't going to make oil come back. Stimulus isn't going to, um, this this was huge. Of all the stuff we were talking about today, well, we talked about a lot of things, but let's talk about it. I'll just skip ahead. This is a, this is a statistic that, that we should most be looking at. How many office workers were in the office in February? Why did they say 27, 28, 25? I guess that's somehow the day of the, the month that they measured it. Anyway, so back in February, everybody was at the office. By March, nobody was at the office. In one month, we stopped going to the office. Now for uh, six months, 10 months, whatever the number is, so eight months, six, none of those numbers, nine months. Now for nine months, nobody's been in the office cobwebs on the computers. Now, let's think about that. Computers are a depreciating asset. You don't use your computer for a year, it still gets old. That These are losses that aren't being booked by companies, but you have to think about that. They didn't use these computers for a year, yet these computers are becoming out of date and getting to the point where they need to be thrown away. Because, you know, three years with a computer, a three-year-old computer on your desk, and you're like, you're just dogging it at work. You can't survive like that. Um, you know, I, I, that's for me anyway, three. I mean, I, I think for me, and even, even when I had, you know, when I had my companies with computers, I think three years I would, you know, as much as I would say my secretaries don't need the greatest computers or whatever, you still need a good, you still need a functional computer. You can't make people sit there and wait for windows and crap like that. Um, 
because that that loses productivity. So I don't think I think three to five years tops for computers. So in other words, you've eaten up twenty percent of the uh, computers of the equipment's useful product life, and that goes for your servers and other things too in the office. Huge amount of equipment's aging out, and a lot of this stuff is on lease. That's also a situation that's going to age out automatically. Um, so a lot of this stuff is aging out and has to be replaced anyway. And it's basically a loss to the customer, to the client. They did not get the um, productivity they expected out of their asset. So that's it's not it doesn't really show up in the books, but it's another way that things are are, are getting sucked out of the economy. But this this is crazy. Look how hard it was to get people back to the office and how quickly we went back down to basically the minimum. And you know, the virus is increasing. We're having more lockdowns and it's Christmas time. I think you're gonna see new lows. And then Biden's gonna come in and tell you if, if it's not necessary for you to be at work, don't be at work. Stop this bullshit. Don't, don't pretend everything's okay because it's not. Because we have to get out of this virus thing. And I talked about that above. I was, I'm like, you, you can't deny your way out of a pandemic. And that's been the Trump plan, right? The Trump plan from day one. In fact, he even actually said a miracle will occur. He actually said that back in like March. He's like, because he was talking about in the spring, the virus will magically go away. That was literally his plan for getting rid of the virus. That some That magically in the spring, the slight warming of the air would cause the virus to die out immediately. That's complete bullshit. Uh, then the plan was that sunlight would cure the virus, right? Remember sunlight? And that he suggested that you inject sunlight into yourself somehow or like put UV uh, bulbs down your throat or I'm, I really don't know what the plan was. <laughs> but he was, there was a news conference where he was talking about like how ultraviolet light would kill the virus and that that was gonna be the cure. and so it was always miracle cure, miracle cure, miracle cure, right? That, that, and then he had his virus task forces, Project Zoom or whatever it was called. Um, I forgot what they called it, but it was Project Project's bullshit, um, which turned out oddly enough not to be the one. None of the, the 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 vaccines that were produced were not done under Trump's project. Um, but anyway. It's the point is no action was taken. No actual action was taken to stop the virus. Just constantly saying the next thing will do it. The next thing will do it. Next miracle cure. Next miracle cure. Next miracle cure. Oh, he was and, and Trump was touting that that bullshit. I forget. He went through a couple of different things. Hydroxychloroquine. Uh, it's just again bullshit, 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 bullshit. And guess what? The virus didn't go away. Your plan to tackle a massive problem can't be, excuse me, people who believe, but prayer. Prayer cannot be your plan. Um, I, I even think religious people understand that, right? God, did, you know, praying to God cannot be the only thing that you do to to, to get yourself out of a situation. And uh, that was essentially what we've been doing. We've just been praying it would go away. It didn't go away, and now we're in the exact same situation we were in. March, April, May, except for like with way more exposures. Um, so anyway, so again, fundamental changes. We have changed the concept. Now, let's get back to this. So what what is the result of this? Well, the result of this is you're home more. For good or ill, you're home more. But, but the problem is we aren't, we did not construct and anybody who anybody who has like a favorite deli knows this, right? Your delis are crowded now. Your the delis in your neighborhood are way crowded at lunchtime. Why? Because all these people, and 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 I would say we have 160 million workforce. You got to think half of them work in offices, right? At least let's say half though. So 80 million people work in an office, and of them now. 80% of those people aren't working in an office. So that's like, you know, let's say 60 million people. So 60, 65 million people are not working in offices. They're working in your neighborhood now. They're, they're home, they're at home doing their office work. Um, so 
what's the disruption here? Well, there's a couple of disruptions. The disruption number one is my deli is crowded at lunchtime because I, I go there and now there's a whole bunch of people that are taking a lunch break. And I'm like, what is this bullshit? I, I, cause I always work at home. So I'm used to going and enjoying myself during at lunchtime. I don't, I don't have to deal with other people um, because they're working. <laughs> they have real jobs and they work. Um, so I would, I, so I, 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 I know what time of days are good to go and it's no longer the case. It's not good to, it's actually now, now a bad time to go at lunchtime to go to the deli. Um, so the local places get overcrowded, which is not bad for them, but think about the Starbucks, think about the Midtown uh, city things and all these stores and all these retailers and all these restaurants that completely depend on the work crowd. There's a whole bunch of restaurants in New York City that are only open for lunch. They are business restaurants. They are there for the lunch crowd. That's all they do. They don't give a crap. At dinner time, the place is cleared out. There's certain neighborhoods in New York are living neighborhoods and certain neighborhoods in New York are, are, are business neighborhoods. Their business neighborhoods have a lot of places that aren't even open after five o'clock. You know, they, they have a lot of places that don't, that, that just basically cater to the business crowd and then they're done at the end of the day. And you walk down Wall Street, it's like a ghost town at night. You know, when you're down there, there's, very, there's not a lot of things going on on Wall Street at nighttime. I mean, everybody's gone home, that's it, end of day. Um, so all around America, that's true. So you think about the way things are organized, businesses are built around other businesses. So in other words, if there's a big, if there's a big uh, park, an office park or something like that, and there's a restaurant here and a place here and a gas station here and this and that, they have to service those people. Now those people aren't there. Those businesses start falling apart. So in this amount of time so far, those businesses, excuse me, those businesses are starting to fail, problem number one. And problem number two is, um, is that we haven't we don't we haven't had enough time for new businesses to start up, and not only that though, but we have the uncertainty of if I'm going to like let's say we could use we have a Starbucks it's always very crowded now we have my deli it's always very crowded now that should the deli next to my deli is a an empty store should he double his size and double his counter and blah 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 because he's so busy well if he does that though what happens when everybody goes back to work. Then he's going to be sitting there with double the rent and double the stuff and double the staff and and the customers will all be gone at lunchtime. So it was a waste of time. You know, it's it's uncertainty, lack of permanence, changing situation. This is what stalls out an economy. Um, you know, capitalism is very adaptive, but it's not well planned. And when you have this kind of uncertainty and when situations can whipsaw back and forth, you don't know which way things are going to go. And then you can't invest. You know, a lot of these small business people are hanging by a thread. They're certainly not going to start throwing money into like expanding their places and getting more rent and so on and so forth. You know, they just throw, if the guy's got a line at the deli, he just lets it, then that's what's happened. Um, even COVID, if we knew it was permanent, then we would start redesigning restaurants and redesigning retail spaces and then we would change the way we do things um i went oh in fact um I, and again capitalism is a good thing sometimes i went to a delray beach has a uh, a market on saturdays you know a, a farmer's market kind of thing so every saturday there's like a whole bunch of people in this thing they probably got about a hundred different vendors and um <clears throat> and it's great it's really fun you, you buy homemade foods and craft foods and farm foods and things like that. And um, and uh, it's just a nice county thing that we do every week. So it's kind of fun. But now we're doing, no, I just went for the first time. It opened up a few weeks ago, but I, but I went for the first time Saturday. I haven't gone in, in the whole year, basically. Um, and it was interesting to see how people have adapted because it used to be that there was food, uh, you know, most people had samples and you would walk around and pick up samples and, and people just grab them with their hands or whatever. Now everybody's behind a, a screen or a glass and they have very little space in which people breathe on each other. You can't possibly breathe on the food. Uh, there's all these, ple some people have plexiglass, some people have something else, but there's always protection, screening, so on and so forth. People have hand sanitizers in front. 
So these are temporary businesses. They're adapting quickly to the changing market conditions. They're adapting to the fact that their clients can't touch the food anymore. They're reacting to the fact that their clients don't want to be breathed on and don't want, and you don't want them breathing on you as a vendor. Um, I am surprised the floor in their plan is they still take cash. Everybody still takes cash pretty much. And I'm like, well, that's stupid. <laughs> Basically, like, don't touch me, don't come near me, but here's the money you just touched. Um, but anyway, the point is, if it's permanent and you know that, then our businesses would have done the same thing, right? Then when you go to a movie theater, they would redesign the movie theater so that you've got uh, uh, screens between you. It'd be, it would be more like uh, the dining places, you know, like, um, uh, what do you call it? AMC has a dining or IMAX, at least like an IMAX where you have like real space between the seats, not like, you know, you're touching the person next to you. Um, so, the, you know, if, if they knew it was permanent, they would space things out and do things differently in movie theaters. They would redesign things. They would redesign sports stadiums. But we, we all have this vision, and, and it's probably true, though, but it's, it's supposed to be temporary. But if it's temporary, that means we're not doing anything to adapt. We're, we're, we're doing prop jobs and, and, and cheap fixes to things that we should make permanent adjustments to, to be safer, but we're not because we feel like, and this is a weird thing too. What is that based on premise? That's based on a premise like, okay, we have this terrible, horrible virus now, and it's forced us to drastically change our habits, and it's been devastating for the global economy, and it's plunged them into massive debt, but as soon as it's over, we're gonna act like it never happened. And then we're gonna go right back to all the bad habits that led to this problem in the first place. And, and, and I'm wishy-washy about this because I am not advocating, and I don't wanna say it, I, I guess it's two parts of my brain. I mean, one part of my brain is saying we should be more careful always, but the other part of my brain is like, I don't wanna live like that. I don't. Nobody does, right? Nobody, I don't want to live in a world where you have to wear a mask all the time. I don't want to live, I mean, and, and frankly, that's Japan. People in Japan are like, what is wrong with you white people? <laughs> because they, they like, uh, not, not everybody, but if you have the tiniest bit of a cold, immediately people put on masks. Anybody with a cold in Japan is incredibly impolite not to have a mask on if you're sick. Um, so they've always done that. And we and we should at least do that. We should at least improve our hygiene. We should be more conscious, things like that. That's the stuff that doesn't totally impact your life would be nice. Yes, food handling people should wear gloves all the time. That would be nice, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I gotta say, I'm not my my brother is a, a germaphobe. He hates he he freaks out like somebody's making a sandwich for him and they start and they put their hand on it like while they're making it you know hold the bread steady while you're cutting it or something like that he freaks out about that and uh, i i never cared but now i now i care because i it's, after all these years of watching him freak out i'm like oh that that is kind of bad <laughs> you know before so fortunately now most people are wearing gloves so they touch my sandwich i'm like okay but then i also have to say i hope, well, I hope he changes his gloves between sandwiches or I hope that's not, you know, I hope he's not wearing the same glove like for eight hours. Um, you're supposed to actually literally, you're, you're literally supposed to in Whole Foods. They take off their gloves. If you tell, if they go from the, the like you tell them to slice up a pound of uh, roast beef, they put gloves on, slice up a pound of roast beef. They say, okay, now I have some turkey. They actually take the gloves off and change the gloves to, change, to, to, to touch the turkey. It's crazy. And I'm like, how many gloves do you guys go through? Um, but that's what I'm talking about, it's changing habits. Some habits need to be changed and you, and, and you need the government to do studies. You need to listen to the scientists. You need to figure out a better way going forward to hopefully screen to make this a better thing. Um, should every single person be tested who gets on a cruise ship forever? Yes. That's the cost of going on a cruise ship. You need to be tested. You need to not make other people sick. We know this. We've already had instances of people getting sick on cruises before and from other things. And it does make sense to test people before they go on a cruise ship. I, I do, you know, I go on cruises a lot. Um, they do want, they do make you wash your hands. Well, they don't make you, but 
you know, they, they're reminding you constantly to wash your hands and, and you can't ever say they don't have for lack of uh, stations where there's Purell and things like that. It's everywhere on a ship. Every every single place, if it's a bar or restaurant or whatever, everywhere you enter, Purell is right at the door and there's usually a person there saying, don't forget to wash your hands. They want you to clean your hands no matter where you just were, clean your hands before you enter a new place. And that's a great practice. It's a practice we could all possibly learn. Um, you know, there are sensible ways to fight viruses. You make surfaces, you change, we start changing the way we make products. We start changing the way we design chairs and tables and desks and the kind of silverware we use or the kind of napkins we use. Um, you do things that are that that are geared towards fighting future viruses to lessen the chance that we have something like this happen. Um, we need to make major global major changes to the way we act. But what we're basically doing now, and this is still the Trumpian way of doing it, is we hope it goes away and then we just go back to our regular lives and forget about it. But you know, this is uh, and th th that's not smart. <laughs> Okay, it's just not. So, so it's, so it's another form of destruction. It's another form of things getting out of control and changing your habits. Now, interestingly, you can look at it from the perspective that the virus has overreached because we would put up with a rhino virus, right? Which is not a, a distant cousin of what we have here, but we put up with the flu. You know why? The flu is not so bad. But that makes the flu a very successful virus, right? Because um, we catch the flu all the time. It's always around. It always spreads. It's a very successful virus. It moves around the population and is constantly there and infects millions and millions and millions of people every single year. But that's because it doesn't kill you. Rarely. Anyway, it does kill some people. It rarely kills you. It doesn't permanently damage you. The problem with uh, COVID is that it does cause very bad damage. It does kill too many people. Therefore, the people will fight COVID in a way they never fought the flu. They never bothered. It wasn't important enough to fight the flu the way they fight COVID, even though we do spend unbelievable amounts of money on, on flu medicine and things like that every year. We never really made a big project to get rid of it because it just isn't bad enough to get rid of. This is bad enough to get rid of. And, and frankly, we could end up wiping out COVID, hopefully, in, in 10 years or so, like by, by obviously improving medicines and so on and so forth, screenings and everything else. Um, so, so the success of it leads to its own destruction, just like OPEC, right? When you get the prices too high, leads to your own destruction. When you're too successful as a virus, um, you can be successful and not lethal, but to be successful and lethal is, is a bad combination because unfortunately you spur the uh, humans to, uh, as, if, as if we are antibodies ourselves, to fight. We are fighting now as a, as a species, we are fighting against this virus. And hopefully we're gonna win. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't look like it when you live in Florida, believe me. <laughs> I really don't see how we're gonna win the way people act down here, but in theory, you know, fortunately, my girls are still up north, so my girl, you know, my girls are basically like way, you know, they, they're like, they, they come down here and they're just like, what are you people doing? <laughs> it's crazy. All right, anyway, so what's this? Uh, da, da, da. Um, Brendan says, why does OPEC have so much control over WTI? Don't they mostly control Brent? They should also want to keep the prices down so that it's not cost effective for the channel. Yeah, well, that's what I was saying. Um, why do they control WTI? Because the whole thing is fixed, okay? Because there's OPEC and then there's the American oil producers too, and they do the same thing. They follow OPEC. They just don't say they're following OPEC. They cut their production too, or they scale back. They have their own little meetings where they talk, but their meetings are on golf courses. They don't go to Vienna and have a meeting and say, how do we manipulate the price of oil like OPEC does? OPEC does because nobody can stop them. You know, the you know, US law would stop Exxon and Enron and everybody from doing that, but they, of course, do. Hi, Phil, what do you think of LRN? And I haven't looked at them in ages. What are they, what are we supposed to be thinking about them right now?
Where are the other two? No oh, reasonable price. A class action suit. <laughs> I haven't paid attention to these guys in ages. You know, I mean, do, is that based on like the remote learning aspects and things? I think, you know, I think they're a solid company. They they got a good history. They're not very expensive. They're only a billion dollars. They make money. You know, but they 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 haven't really. This is half the year this year. They didn't really get a big boost so far this year. Um, they don't make much money. So I'm not, you know, I'm not 100% a fan or anything like that, but I think it's a reasonable little thing to buy. Um, just not one of my favorites, unfortunately. I mean, it's just not nothing we really pay attention to anyway. So if there's a reason that you think it's good, let me know, I'd be interested. Um, and then Mitchell says, Phil, been paying attention to you for the last couple of years and been a member this year and never missed the webinar. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, is it accurate to say your current feeling is that we really should go mostly to cash? Oh, yes, absolutely. My current feeling is that we should be mostly in cash, all cash, or in the very least, very well hedged. Because I think the market, look, we were talking about that yesterday, right? I think the market, let's see if John Luke did a chart today. Oh, no chart from John Luke today. Slacking. <laughs> Let's see. All right, so open that in the new window, in the new tab. Ooh, very slow. All right. Oh, here you go. Okay, so here's the S&P. Now, our baseline for the S&P is still 2850. That's way down here. Basically, 3280, uh, 400 down is 36. So it'll be this much down from here, which is basically down here. So our benchmark for the S&P is way down here. And that's big. It's based on valuation. It's based on what, how much money they actually make. The S&P 500 companies, how much money they actually make multiplied by a reasonable valuation, like 15, 16%, not 30, you know, 25, 30% that we're at now. So I think the I think all this is really overvalued on the S&P. So wait, what was the question? I forgot. <laughs> oh, I cash, yeah. Anyway, so I think we're massively overvalued. I do think. There are allowances, so I'm talking about hist I'm talking about historically of value. Now, prop thing number one, I'm willing to concede ten percent because of Trump's tax cuts. Okay, so uh, this is a fifteen percent line. This is a zero percent line. So I'm willing to concede ten percent all the way up to here, which is twenty eight fifty times ten, which is uh, two eight five zero times ten. Oh, look at that. I did completely wrong. Two eight five zero times one point one. Let's try that. Thirty one thirty five. Okay, so I'm I'm willing to concede thirty one thirty five, which is actually yeah, well, obviously it's still where I said it was. It's right here. So I'm willing to concede thirty one thirty five, which we pretty much tested because this was a fifteen percent line. I'm talking about the ten percent line. I believe that's reasonable because of the tax cuts of the corporations. They pay much less tax than they used to pay. That means they make more profit. Therefore, they're worth more money. That's a big piece of why corporations are up now. So I'll concede that. Uh, I will concede 5%, which brings us all the way up to the 15% line. I will concede 5% due to the complete lack of regulations under the Trump administration. That corporations can do whatever the hell they want that they can they can burn down the environment they can they can uh, they can kill people it doesn't matter what you do you're pretty untouchable as a corporation right now and this court's not going to change so it'll be very hard to roll back these regulations because it's one thing to pass a regulation but once you undo the regulation 
when you when when they want to redo the regulation, the um, the uh, corporations will take them to court. Now understand that previously, environmental regulations were passed. This is this is why Trump has done such incredible damage to the planet, to our species, and everything else. Environmental regulations were passed in the 70s and 60s, right, to protect the planet. First, they passed a regulation saying, you know, don't build dams where you're going to cut off the water supply to endangered species or something like that. So first, you, you know, don't, don't strip mine, don't strip mine habitats, things like that. Um, so first, you pass a regulation. That's one thing. So Congress passes regulation. Problem number one, once you undo, once you undo the regulation, somebody has to pass it again. Congress has to approve it again. But step number two is the law gets appealed. When, you pay, when Congress passes a law and a corporation or any rich person doesn't like the law, then, the, then those people can go to the Supreme Court because they have the kind of law firms that can get their things to the Supreme Court. And they go to the Supreme Court or to major federal courts where Trump has appointed huge amounts of judges. And they go to the court and they say, this is unfair. My business is being harmed by this. The Koch the, the, uh, brothers, um, who spent billions and billions of dollars to put Trump in power, uh, they are big coal people. And they get to go to the Supreme Court and they get to go to the federal court and they get to say, you know, uh, there's this stupid little snail daughter thing and it's in this river, but we really need to build a mine. And, uh, you know, we want we want another mine in this area and, uh, and, and the, they want us to put in all this expensive stuff just to protect this one little thing. Is that really right, Your Honor? And, the, and then the, the conservative judge that was appointed by, by Trump goes, oh, hell no, screw that thing. <laughs> Let it die. You know, that's, that's the new normal now. So it's not, it's not just that like Joe Biden can't just go, go into power now and snap his fingers and re-regulate everything. Regulations have to be, once they're undone, you have no regulation. Once you want to pass a regulation, you got to go through a whole process and with a uncooperative Congress, and uncooperative courts, you're probably not going to get there. That's why the damage Trump has done is so incredibly bad. Even Joe Biden just said yesterday, which I quoted today, if we can, if Obamacare survives, because because Trump has put Obamacare on a, on a path to to be destroyed. I mean, that's what he's been working on for four years, but he's he's done so much damage to the Affordable Care Act that it may not be savable in its current form. And then what happens? And then we have to start from scratch again. And the last one got appealed to the Supreme Court and so on and so forth. But now we have a different Supreme Court. So this time when we appeal to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court may say, no, nope, no Affordable Care Act, bye. And that's the end of it, gone. Why? We changed the court. The voters didn't change their mind. The voters voted for Biden. So the voters didn't vote to get rid of the Affordable Care Act Trump decided to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. They packed the courts, and now they now we have a, a very good chance of getting rid of it, of destroying it. Then we got to start from scratch, try to build another another healthcare system. So you know the the the, the things we do to ourselves, these things, it's not like a little thing. It seems easy, but it's very easy to destroy. It's not easy to build. So anyway, so where were we? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, complete lack of regulation. That's right, so complete lack of regulation. So that's why you get this. This is now the must hold line of the S&P. It's probably the 15% line at 3280. Uh, that's basically the new must hold line. We haven't adjusted the charts yet though because we haven't seen what's, what's really gonna hold up and what's gonna happen. We haven't seen a correction, but all the rest of this, and we're at 25% getting to 30%. This is 10% of fluff. But if we pull back and we hold up the 20% line, I would be willing to start looking at raising this. But, but we need to see what Biden undoes. He's not going to undo the regulations. We're stuck with that. We're stuck with an unregulated economy. And we've taken decades step backwards in regulating corporate America. We've taken decades step backwards in taxing corporate America. 
but that can possibly be fixed in a, in a shorter amount of time. Certainly not right away, though. You can't just tomorrow snap your fingers and say, okay, corporations pick down, go back to paying double what you're paying now. Even though Trump did snap his fingers and let them pay half of what they're paying. But you can't you can't do it the other way. It's difficult. And again, court fights everything else. Nobody went, nobody took Trump to court to, <laughs> no, no corporations took Trump to court to say, don't lower our taxes, stop, that's wrong. That didn't happen, right? But when you raise them, oh, you better have the constitution backing you up. You better have full authority. And also, again, you have to fight through Congress to get it to be done. So that's that's where we stand. That, and, and that's why I'm, I'm, you know, again, leaning towards, I, I think that some of this can be undone, which means we'd be at the 10% line, but not all of it. But we haven't changed the chart yet. And we haven't changed our baseline yet. Because if you take away all the stuff Trump has done, we're still at 2850. And that means we're like 50% overvalued here. Well, not 50. What was 36? 36, 28. Uh, da, da, da. It's not that much. Um, if we're at 36 minus 28 divided by, so 8 divided by 28, 30%. We're 30% over. Well, we are. We're over. We're overvalued by the entirety of this, basically. So will we resolve? Will we will we drop back down tremendously? No, but I think that probably in the zone, in in the twenty percent zone, I think we'll probably settle back down around here. Thirty four twenty is probably more realistic. We may go down to this level and we may hold this, but again, it depends. How do we adapt to the virus? When is it going to be cured? How much are we going to recover? So on and so forth. All these questions still hang in the balance. Good time to look at the beige book, but I'll see if there's a question in between. Um. Oh, anyway, so the so the, the 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 main point of that question was going to cash. I still feel we're going to get a snapback uh, correction that will knock us down 10 percent, possibly more than ten percent. I think that between now and the end of the year, I think that people are going to start selling off their stocks because one thing Biden will do is raise capital gains taxes. So. The combination of having a bad fourth, a bad first quarter next year, a bad fourth quarter results because of the retail sales being down, um, and then and then obviously Biden might raise taxes on companies next year. Biden will uh, probably raise taxes on on high level capital gains, things like that. <clears throat> There's a lot of factors that would make you want to sell your stocks and take your money off the table at this at now. And I mean for people who have you know massive amounts of money and huge amounts of money in the stock market these are huge gains you're going to have to take a profit you want to take a profit while the taxes are cheap and also we also the dollar is being devalued so so if you take your gains off the table before the dollar gets too low you can put it into things that are going to offset your inflation also lrm randy says he looked at it from the perspective of being more on more money being spent on K-12 education uh, and Joe Biden. Well, okay. I mean, yeah, I imagine Joe Biden would be interested in education. I don't know the dynamics with LRN. But yeah, okay, I can see it's, it, you consider it a growth space. That makes sense. Um, <clears throat> do you think AQN is a safe dividend stock for the long term? I am in at $10 a share. Well, what's the dividend on those guys? I mean, you know, usually the utility stocks are, uh, you know, safe-ish. Um, they're trading high at 20 times earnings high for utility stock. But is there any danger to the dividend? It's 4%. That's nice. Um, you have to remind me here in the chat room because I'm going to have to actually, uh, you know, take a look at it and figure it out from that perspective. Um, I, I mean, there's a very boring utility stock, and I don't think there's any problem with them. Um, I'm not sure how they mix is product-wise. Oh no, not that. Uh, 
So electrical, blah, 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 blah. Company owns hydroelectric, wind, solar, thermal, um, and electric, natural gas, water, wastewater. You know, it's it's just a basic, nice little small utility company. There's nothing wrong with them. Uh, I, don't, I don't see any particular reason they would be dangerous. I don't see any particular reason they'd be, they'd be great. Uh, you know, usually utility companies are regulated in such a way that they're going to make their money one way or the other. You know, in other words, if, if their situation worsens, they get to raise their rates. And that, and oh, by the way, that's a big problem. Um, you know, as people go off the grid and start putting more solar power, and Biden's going to have to deal with this with his program. As people go off solar, uh, I mean, sorry, go off the grid and go solar and whatever for their homes, if if they're using 50% less power, the way the regulations are, are, are working work is that, that the, your power company is supposed to make X amount of money. That's that's like a deal they have with the government. They're like, okay, we make 20% a year. That's what we make. You know, whatever this, what, how we get to that number, our rates have to be such that we make this money. So the problem is, as more and more people go off the grid, and more, and they're, they're effectively, everyone who goes off the grid is not contributing to the profit of that power company. That then means that the burden of profit shifts to the remaining consumers. So more and more and more, the people who don't get off the grid are going to be penalized, while the people who get off the grid are going to get away from it, and the prices are going to go up, and more people go off the grid, et cetera, et cetera. But eventually, that model is going to break down because they want, you know, it's, it's like Social Security, right? Like you're supporting a system where if you leave one third of the people supporting the entire power company, their rates are going to be through the roof. It's not a supply and demand thing. They have a fixed cost of operating a hydroelectric dam and a nuclear power plant and et cetera, et cetera. Those costs don't change just because people don't want the electricity anymore. There's going to be huge upheaval in this industry over the next decade. And people aren't expecting that. And they're certainly not planning on these long-term dividend stocks. So... You, you you kind of want to look. It's a weird thing because you never have to. You have to look at them and treat them almost like cable companies. You have to see what the subscriber growth is. You know we're not there yet with with the programs, but once Biden rolls out like some real alt energy in, uh, incentives for people to get off the grid, it's going to start affecting these guys, and 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 not in a small way. One percent of the people, if one percent of your neighbors get off the grid, that means your bill goes up one percent because the power company still needs that money. 2% up 2%, 5% up 5%, 10% up 10%. When, do you, you know, when does it break for you? That's the thing. But then if too many people break away from the power company, the whole system, the model falls apart. So the power companies are allocated a certain ter territory and they've got a certain cost base that can't be changed. It's a massive infrastructure thing that they've got. And suddenly their customer base is changing on them. I mean, of course, you know, demographics change, people move in and out of places, but generally you've got a certain population you're covering and you know what you're going to be billing people. Now we don't know. That certainty of having a, a utility company is no longer there. And again, it doesn't make this one a bad one, but it's uh, these are nice small regional guys, it's not a big deal. But you can't think about utility companies the same way we used to think about them. They are in an eroding market. Their market share is being attacked by Alt Energy. And my boys at Lockheed Martin, stock of the century, by the way, although we're 20 years into the uh, century already, but Lockheed Martin, 10 years away from fusion, maybe less. That's it. That's Lights out. Well, I mean, I guess they can lease the fusion reactors to the existing utility companies, so because they can distribute the fusion on the 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 energy on the grid. But that's that's there's still going to be drastic changes, and and fusion may not require these great big utility companies because if you can have a safe fusion reactor in your neighborhood, it is much cheaper to distribute power from your neighborhood fusion reactor, and just you know, use local lines with short transmission things and so on and so forth. Um, 
I think 50% of the energy uh, uh, that we produce in this country is lost in transmission. Like a crazy number like that. Yeah. It's very disturbing. How? How? Five percent. Well, that's not bad. Why do you think it was fifty percent? Lost in transmission. How much energy is severe? Oh, power paint your plug. That's what I want to know. Five percent's not bad. I thought it was fifty percent. Energy lost in power plant. Sixty-five percent. See? Ugh. Doesn't mean this one's right and that one's wrong. It just means the answer is not definitely one or the other. How can this guy say five and the other guy says the other? That seems odd. How big a power line losses? Schneider Electric. See again, how do we know how how do we know what he knows? It's a whole research thing has to be done. Overall losses power plant range of eight to fifteen percent. So that's what Schneider says. And he's never steered us wrong yet, right? So whatever the number is, <laughs> we have there's definitely transmission costs. So it's much more efficient to have a local reactor. And how are we doing on that? Uh, Lockheed Martin Fusion. Well, you want to invest in the future. Compact Fusion, Lockheed Martin. Wow, it's on their way. It didn't it didn't used to be on their website. Now it's on their website. I mean, it was a wow, dudes. How fun, right? That was on there before. I've seen that before. See, this is what they're talking about. Compact fusion on a freaking plane. So the power of the ships with it, power planes with it, apparently you can get on a rocket with it, power a city of 50 to 100,000 people. Good stuff. Oh, look, they're hiring. See how happy she looks? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> All right. Anyway, good luck. So <clears throat> anyway, that's supposed to happen in the next 10 years. That is going to really change the world. So if we can just make, if we can just make it that long, if we can, we almost did, we almost didn't make it. We, we can, we're coming really close to not making it, but hopefully we can make it ten years. And then you, and that, and that's something they don't account for when they do those global, the, the global warming models. They don't account for a sudden, complete shift in your usage of power. But again, look at the disruption that causes. Think about what that will do to these utility companies. Think about the disruption of all these jobs and the shifts and the changes and so on and so forth. I mean, we'll adapt, but it's still very, very disruptive. Powell says no rift with Mnuchin signals the Fed not stepping back. Um, shortly after Mnuchin requested the Powell return money, the Fed released a terse statement saying one of the full suite of measures uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so anyway, so Powell and Mnuchin say they're on the same page of getting things done and so on and so forth. So hopefully, yes, hopefully that's good. Oh, and speaking of which, we should look at the Beige Book. Beige Book. La, 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 la. All right, now. <clears throat> For those of you who haven't heard me do this before, my voice is going, but we'll see how we go. Woof, hate the way it's formatted now. It used to be so much nicer. This is really annoying. Okay. So what I look for is the, you know, this. you can't just read it. You have to think about how they're saying things. So first of all, there's 13 districts. Here's your districts. So 
you got to watch the spin words and how they say it. So they say most districts, so that means more than seven or seven or more, have characterized economic expansion as modest or moderate since the prior. However, four districts described little or no growth. See that? And five narratives noted that the activity remained below pre-pandemic levels for at least some sectors. Okay, well, der. So since the prior beige book, which we had just seen, which I forgot already, was October. So since October 2nd, so in two months, most federal, and now don't forget, now since we know that five have serious issues, and we know there are 13 districts, then we know that it's no more than eight have characterized modest or moderate expansion, right? Five have obviously said things are not good. So at most, eight of them have said and have, have noted that, um, so, so at least if you take most literally, then it should be at least seven, at least seven and possibly eight, but no more than eight out of 13 have said that the expansion is modest to moderate. There are four that say, I don't see anything growing. I don't see any improvement over October. And one of them, or five, well, five, well, five, five, I'm sorry, five of them say they're, that they're below pre-pandemic net levels. Of course they are. Everything's below pre-pandemic levels. So honestly, that's a silly statement. Philadelphia and three of, oh, they, they hardly ever name a specific district like that. Philadelphia and three of the four Midwestern districts observed that activity began to slow in November as cases surge. Now that's interesting because now you have to look and see, I don't want to get into this virus thing, if I can avoid it, I'm trying to be upbeat. Um, oh, frick, virus growth by state. Okay. Da, 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 da. Oh, <laughs> so bad. Red. Bad. Every, everywhere in the country. Look at that. Puerto Rico. Good Puerto Rico. Good job. Virgin Islands. Good job. Hawaii. Good job. And they were bad for a while. Guam. Bad job. <gasps> oh, my God. Northern Mariana Islands. All right. Yeah. Both of you guys. <laughs> Both, both, all two, all part, and, and Samoa, all eight of you guys. That's fantastic. It's like 25 people on two islands that can't manage to stay away from each other. Um, otherwise, we're screwed, though. <laughs> so, this is doomsday in here. Oh, let's see, my beloved Florida, 7,000 cases a day, 36 per 100,000. 7,000 a day. New Jersey, 4,000 a day, so it's half as bad. New Pennsylvania, 6,000 a day. It's also horrifying. Uh, where is New York? Oh, there's New York. New York, 7,000 a day. You know, we got half the population in New York, but we're keeping up. California, where is California, 14,000 a day. Oh, that's our same as Florida, 36 per 100,000, 36 per 100,000. That's what you got to look at. 27, 26, 45, 54. Holy crap. 54 out of 100,000 people per day. 87 out of 100,000. See, tightly populated. That's the problem with those guys. Wow. 71, 80, 65, 69, 57, 105 in Nebraska. You can't stay away from each other in Nebraska. Jesus, South Dakota, another state with no people. 99, North Dakota, what are you people doing? Oh, there's a funny article this morning. Oh, <laughs> idiots. Um, what was it? It was like a swingers convention, and they all got, and not they all got, but 45 people. Where was that? Day of New Orleans, idiots. New Orleans swingers event becomes a super spreader. 41 people tested. Yeah, if you all have sex, you're going you're gonna to transmit the disease, you morons. Unbelievable. 
So where were we? Beige book, right? Yes, beige book. Okay. So, so the thing is, you say, okay, Philadelphia and three or four Midwestern districts. So we already saw where the worst places are. So now we go back and take a look again. So Philadelphia, 51 per 100. Three or four Midwestern districts were obviously horrendous down here. So probably these guys. Okay, probably these guys are in the in the in the year 100. So, so the states where notable and that and that Philadelphia, of course, is not like all of Pennsylvania. I'm sure Philadelphia's probably got numbers up like this. So when a hundred people out of a hundred thousand get sick on a daily basis, people seem to start noticing and they start freaking out and their economic uh, activity changes. That, so this is the interpretation. You can't just read something, you gotta think about what it's saying. So now we say, okay, so now we see a threshold and that threshold is hitting 100. And when you get to 100 people out of 100, out of 1,000, was it per 1,000? Memory, per 100,000. When it's 100, that was one in 1,000 people one in 1,000 people per day in your state. When one in 1,000 people per day in your state are getting infected, that's finally the tipping point where even people in red states go, uh-oh, this is bad. That's when, it that's when the light bulb comes on. So now you got to think to yourself, okay, that's a benchmark. That means we gotta watch states that are getting that bad because the states that get to that threshold, and when you start seeing a big state like Texas get to that threshold or Florida get to that threshold, now you're gonna have a massive economic impact as we cross those lines. So you don't know for sure, but this is how we sort of check the behavior and check the trends. That's why I was talking about trends this morning. You got to think about the trends and think about where the trends are, what the trigger points are, and what's going to happen. So when I start seeing other states approaching those levels, and those states are economically important states, then we know we're going to have a problem. And this has taken 30-something days to show up. So then we also know the timing of it. Reports indicated higher than average growth of manufacturing, distribution, logistics, and things from existing home sales, although not without disruptions. The problem is when they talk about growth, also you got to realize they're talking about growth compared to like last quarter, last report, that's coming off ridiculous lows. So how do you really make a statement like that? Um, banking contacts in numerous districts reported some deterioration of loan portfolios. That's not good, obviously, particularly for commercial loaning into the retail and leisure. And, and they're obviously no surprise. They're running out of money. Retail, leisure, hospitality. Businesses are basically shut down. My mother and I uh, went out to dinner yesterday and we went to a restaurant. It's brand new. I, was, I, I, I kind of can see where, you know, maybe they got a great deal on the lease and maybe they decided that they would have a sort of a, you know, they're doing a soft open because, you know, they, they know it's not going to be busy in, this, in Christmas time. Uh, but with the virus and all, but at least they figure like maybe in May, June, so they're going to be open. But to me, it's like they're carrying it for six months with with an opening now, it seems odd. But it was really good. It was Peruvian. It was good food. Uh, anyway, my mother and I were at one table. This is, a, they had 50 tables, I would say, in the restaurant. My mother and I were at one table. There was one other group having dinner and two people at the bar. <laughs> that was it with 50 tables in the restaurant. I felt so bad for these guys, and they were so happy to have us come in and all that. But I mean, that's just that's just I mean, it, you know, where where I live in a touristy place, that's like crazy. So that's why I go out for dinner. I mean, you know, me and my mom go out about once a week or twice a week. We'll go have dinner or something, but we go to places that are generally open, uncrowded, so on and so forth. And she told me she said this place is down the street from me, and uh, that no one's there. I said, oh, let's go there. <laughs> based on based on the emptiness, I don't mind going. But um, it's not good. So I mean, things are not, you know, retail, the, 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 this, you understand. So, so they, they've gotten to the point now they're not getting free money anymore. They can't pay their loans. What's going to happen? Deterioration of credit is a bad, bad thing. Um, commercial lending. An increase in delinquencies in 2021 is more widely anticipated. Things are not getting better. Most districts report that the firm's outlook 
the firm's outlooks remain positive because, and, I, and it's the same thing, like I said, the guy opened this restaurant. People think that the virus is going to go away as soon as you start vaccinating people. That's not how it works. They think the economy is going to go right back to normal. They think everyone's going to go back to normal. Not how it works. We have to have a recovery period. It's going to take time. Um, however, I, I, outlook remain positive. However, optimism has waned. Many contacts cited concerns over the recent pandemic wave, mandated restrictions, uh, again with Biden coming in, uh, and the looming expectation expiration dates for unemployment benefits, which we run out on the 31st of this month. No more, no more benefits. And, uh, and and also people can now be evicted and foreclosed. This is incredible catastrophes that are still lined up to happen. Horrifying, catastrophic things are going to happen very shortly. And this president, Trump, not doing anything about it at all. Congress, not doing anything about it at all. They can't even read our stimulus package. I mean, well, the Democrats want to. That's what they're concerned about. They're concerned about the unemployment. They're concerned about the eviction. The Republicans like, no, 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 we're evicting everybody. Screw that. They're like, we're not going to give you a paycheck and we're going to evict you. That's It's a two-part deal. Why? Because that's what rich people like to do. They like to take over properties. They like to buy things for ten cents on the dollar. So kicking kicking poor people out of for out of properties is what they like to do. Um, nearly all districts reported that the employment rose, but for most the pace was slow. And and we just got a negative report today. And the best recovery remained incomplete. We're getting a big report, big non-farm payroll on Friday. Firms that were hiring continue to report difficulties in attracting and retaining workers. Many contacts noted. Sharp rising cases, had precipitating with school closings, renewed fears of infection, uh, which of course we knew was a horrifying mistake. Further aggravated labor supply, including absenteeism, blah, blah, blah. Providing for childcare and virtual schooling need was widely cited, a significant growing issue for the workforce. Uh, some firms have accommodations in several districts. Firms feared that the employment levels would fall over the winter before recovering. That's exactly what is happening. Despite hiring difficulty, firms in most districts reported wages grew. At a, slight, at a light, slight or modest pace to overall. However, many noted greater pressure to raise rates for low-skilled workers, minimum wages rising, especially in outlying areas. Staffing firms describe greater placement success with competitive rates. One firm instituted a minimum wage rate for its industry industrial clients. Uh, prices input, okay. Uh, slight to moderate increases of input prices, selling prices of vinyl goods rose. Contacts no COVID cases cause ongoing disruptions, delays in short staff. Transportation costs are going up, and then they go. Then they break it down by regions, which is really annoying the way they do it. Um, oh, and then they do each one. So anyway, so that's it. Nothing exciting, but the point is nothing to get excited about. Not nothing. Nothing to justify this. Why is this happening? Because what? So that's why I think we need to be mostly in cash. I mean, it's, I cannot justify spending the kind of money that this market is commanding. And I want to wait. And if it's if it's real, if it's so great and the virus will be over and we're going to have an economic boom and blah, 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 then we're not missing a thing. It's going to just keep going up and up and up forever and ever and ever, and it's never going to stop, and there'll be free money, and we will get stimulus, so we can always go buy back in and buy stuff. But if we get a sharp, sudden 5 10% correction, 20% correction over a short amount of time, it's hard to pull out. So I would rather cash out while the market's on fire, get top dollar for our positions, and then just wait, take, the, take Christmas off. Relax. Don't have to trade all the time. You know, you didn't become a trader to work 18 hours a day. You're supposed to have time off. You're supposed to be able to relax. You're supposed to be able to do stuff with your family. I know it's boring now. There's nothing really to do. It's It sucks. But, you know, realistically, it's just it's not always a good time to trade. And this is definitely not a good time to trade. That's how I feel about it. Sure.
It's too uncertain, too many things could possibly go wrong. So last of all, we'll check our, just do a quick check on the virus, see, see how we're doing. I'm sure, it's, I'm sure everything's fine. Uh, only 60 million cases globally last week. 60 million cases globally. 12.6 uh, million in the US. So let's, let's clear that, it's too messy. 60 million globally, 12.6 6 in the US, 1.4 million global deaths, and 260,000, 261,000 US deaths. There you go. Okay. So now we refresh this and see how much better we're doing. <gasps> Look. We're totally red. No, 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 it's still a little space over there. A little space. Is that a space or is that just red on top of red? I think that might be red on top of red. I don't even know if that's a space. Yeah. Control plus. Oh, that's interesting. The screen doesn't respond to being made bigger. Oh, there's a plus. Let's see. Oh, no, no, it was a space. There's some spaces there. There you go. See that? Okay, so right there we got the sliver of visibility. There's still some people alive right there. <laughs> it's like a it's like the zombie movies, right? There's still some survivors in this there, possibly here. But to get there, we have to go through this zone, and it's gonna be bad. <laughs> I gotta warn you, there's a lot of crawlers out there. <laughs> oh, we're so screwed. Anyway, all right, so now uh, drum roll, please. And da, 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 da. oh, it's taking a long time. <gasps> still there, still that little space. Okay, good. All right, so sixty-four million are now dead. Oh, not no, sorry, not dead. Infected. Sixty-four million. So that's four million more since last week. Not ideal. All right. 13.7 in the U.S., 12.6, 13.7, that's 11, no, wait, 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 there's 1.1 million new infections in a week. Oh, I can't do the math. It's obviously more than, more than uh, 100,000 a day, for sure, that's 107, uh, and four sevenths is about 106. 60,000 a day is our average for the week. That's about right. So we're averaging 160,000 people a week getting infected. Now, death wise, 87,000 people died globally, and 11,000 of those people were in the US. So just, you know, it, it looks, see, that's interesting because the, um, the death number and the infection number are moving up at exactly the same pace. The same percentage. So that's where we are. And you can see here that basically are roughly one third of the people in two thirds of the people infected have re well, I'm sorry. This is bad. How is that right? This I, I don't trust this number, it doesn't make any sense. U.S. deaths in New York, 37,000 people died, 85,000 recovered. That makes no sense. I hope that's not true. That makes sense. A million people recovered, 22,000 died. That's a number I could believe. 44,000 died in New Jersey. 44,000, 17,000 dead? It, does, it just seems like they're not reporting these statistics very well, right? Can't be the right numbers. So we have no idea whether that's true or not. That just seems like it just, that number doesn't seem like it could possibly be true. But anyway, oh, excuse me. So obviously it's never been this bad before, much worse than it was. Uh, it's spreading rapidly. We're up to 160,000 cases per day. Now remember again, China really, 
hasn't even had 100,000 total cases. They had about 80,000 for a long time. So every single day now, more people get infected in America than were infected in China total ever. Every single day. That's why we, specifically Americans, are not allowed to travel to most of the world without going into quarantine for two weeks. Can't go anywhere. Can't even go to Canada. I'm not sure about Mexico. I know I can't go to Canada because I was going to. Uh, really bad. Anyway, so that's all fun and games. We won't worry about that. It's Christmas time. So let's ignore it and pray for a miracle. <laughs> that's our plan. And we will see what happens. But meanwhile, um, just got to watch the show. We're going to sit back and see how far this can go. We know it's silly. We know it doesn't make any sense. We know there's no support for this stick. This is a monthly stick on the daily. It's the monthly stick. You can see it. There's the monthly stick, monthly stick, monthly stick. So for the month of November and we're into early December, we're in amazing shape. I think we pull back. And on the S&P, that's going to be a couple of hundred points. A couple of hundred points on the S&P is $10,000. If we can time our uh, short right. We're looking at 3440. I'm sorry, 3640. 3640 is the line in the sand. But we said 3704 is the 35% line. That's the next line in the sand. So, so I'm going to start getting very interested in shorting if we go up a bit higher because the cutoff, if we cut off with a couple hundred dollar loss up here, if we if we don't pick it correctly compared to the possibility of getting a ride to 3,400, which would be 300 S&P points for $15,000 per contract. Why would I not want to take that bet? Risk, risk losing a couple of hundred bucks for a potential $15,000 gain. That's the way you play. So we'll see what happens. But I, I just think, again, the fact that we can, come on, the fact that we can even have this discussion about the virus and what's going on and the fact that their 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 initial plan for the for the vaccine is to give out a few thousand shots and they're being limited and blah 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 and they don't know when they can do it that's all it's all tricky stuff i, I just don't have the comfort to be heavily invested right now i really don't so i'm sorry if that makes it a little bit boring but it's a good time to relax and just contemplate what we're going to do down the road but the best thing to do is just wait, sit back, gather more information and figure it out. And we'll do that together. Anyway, thanks everybody for coming. I appreciate it. Um, oh, maybe a question. One more question if I have one. Let's see. Hmm. No, wait. Da, da, da. No, I think we got to everything. Fantastic. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much for coming. Have a wonderful weekend or rest of your week or whatever it is. I don't know what day it is anymore. It's Wednesday. And uh, we'll do it again next week. All right. Take care, everybody. Oh, yeah. I'm on uh, Money Talk next week. We'll, we'll do the, the webinar. I'll be doing the show Tuesday. I think they tape it. And then Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, I'm on the show. So we'll talk about the show on Wednesday, I'm sure. All right. Take care.